soft at times. Well, anyway, great to see you folks here today. And our scripture lesson is taken from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And it reads like this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. God bless us with understanding as we have read his word this morning. All right. Um, today's message is uh, a profound question, really. It has a big question mark behind it on what is God's will, right? Your will be done. Every devoted Christian should be interested in discovering God's will for their lives. But what is God's will? Is God's will something that we have to climb the highest mountain and seek the old wise man with the white beard to find out what his will is? Is God's will something that's hiding beneath a rock somewhere? Or maybe God's will is so obvious that it's everywhere. Or maybe God's will is something that, that we might miss, that we might pass it by if we're not paying attention. Or maybe God's will is something that we can spoil or ruin or change somehow. What is God's will? We're told in Scripture that God's will is what pleases him and what his um, plans are. God's plans and what pleases him is God's will. So then the next question should be, how do we then know God's will once we find out that there is a will that God has for our lives? In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, we're told, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You will seek me. And find me when you seek me with all your heart. With part of your heart? With an occasional part of your heart? With maybe just a thought here and there? How do we please him? How do we draw closer to him so he could draw closer to us? When we seek him with what? When we seek him with what? Part or? Whole, right? Our whole heart. All. See, we will never fully understand God and himself. I mean, this God who created the cosmos, uh, this week the announcement was made by scientists that... Um, what they thought was the visible end of the universe, they're finding out was just the beginning to another part of the universe. It's profound. It's gigantic. It's bigger than anything our little minds can imagine. And yet this is the universe which God spoke into his existence. How do we think that in our finite minds, we're going to understand everything about God in this side of heaven. It's impossible. But we do have from God his holy word. We do have from God a glimpse 
of who he is, of what he's done, and what he requires. In the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, we're told, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is what God requires of us. So we may not understand everything about God, but we understand this part, don't we? That this is what he requires from us. That this is part of knowing and being in God's will. I mean, what do they mean when people talk about being in God's will? Well, another thing that God wills is that no one should perish. Second Peter. Second Peter reminds us that no one, that God wants no one to perish. This is the will of God, that no one should perish, that no one should be lost, but that all would come to salvation through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, we see these different pictures of God's will. Of God's will being done in our lives. The psalmist said in Psalm 43.10, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on leveled ground. That's what he wants. To lead us on level ground. This is what Jesus taught his disciples when he taught them to pray. When they came up to him and said, you know what, Lord, John is teaching his disciples how to pray. How should we pray? And Jesus said, this is how you should pray. He started off with our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your what? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, when I pray that prayer and that part says on earth, I go like this because this is me. I'm part of the earth. Let God's will be done on this part of the earth. On this, uh, uh, the Bible says that we come from the ground. We're dust. Let your will be done in this dust, in this ground as it is in heaven. He taught his disciples to pray God's will in our lives. So this is something desirable to seek and know what God's will is in your life. So how do you know what God is willing for your life? That's, that's the deep question, right? How do I know what God's will is for my life? Well, we got the scriptures. We got the Bible that tells us. We just read before, right, that this is what God requires of us. This is part of knowing God's will. And sometimes we want God's will in a way that is tangible and visible. But sometimes God speaks his will to us through a small, still voice. Sometimes it's through the promptings of the Holy Spirit that's leading and guiding us if we are surrendered to him. This is what Paul tells us in Romans that we just read earlier. Romans 12. I'll read that again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. First of all, he wants us to know that the only reason why we can know God's will, the only reason why we could have this relationship with God is because of his mercies. His mercies mercies towards us, his grace towards us, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, uh, we could easily say, oh, I'll die for Jesus. But the question is, will you live for Jesus? 
Would you live daily his praises to sing? We offer our bodies, what we do with our bodies, how we behave with our bodies, where we take our bodies to and who we share our bodies with. We sacrifice that to the Lord in our dedication and devotion to him. And then what does that bring to us? What does that give us? Is that just a don't do thing? No, there is a benefit to that. When we surrender our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is what happens. First of all, that's our true worship. And then second of all, we get to know what God's will is for our lives. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, no matter how much we think that the direction we want to take our lives is a good thing, God's plan is better. No matter how pleasing we think it's going to be in doing things our way, doing them God's way is more pleasing. And no matter how perfect we think that we have everything put in place, we have all our I's dotted and our T's crossed. It's God's plan for our life that's perfect. It's surrendering. And he tells us not to be conformed to the pattern of this world. This world is a tricky place. Satan is an angel of light and he will disguise himself as something good to fool us. And that's why we need the direction of the Holy Spirit to discern what is God's and what is not. He says it clearly here. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. This world has a pattern. A pattern of hate. A pattern of revenge. A pattern of greed. A pattern of of Searching your own way first and putting others last. That's the pattern of the world. The pattern of justifying and, and, and searching constantly for the pleasures. And instead of just sacrificing, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, the pattern of the world wants to change us. The pattern of the world wants to transform us. The pattern of the world wants us to be like them. And Paul is saying no. No, listen, in knowing God's will and knowing God's good, pleasing and perfect will, you have to change. There has to be a transformation that takes place. Do not be conformed or shaped into the pattern of the world, but be transformed, he says. Transform. I remember when my kids were little, they loved these toys called the Transformers. How many of you ever stepped on I mean, I heard of them. Right? The Transformers. And they loved playing with those things for hours. And what the Transformers were were these simple little cars and planes and boats. And when you fold them out, they turned into robots. Right? They developed a whole comic book series and cartoons and even major movies out of these things. To be transformed, to take a shape and change it. And so Paul is telling us, listen, the world, Satan, is doing everything in its power to conform you to his way of thinking and doing things. But then he tells us, but be transformed, be changed into a new image. And what image would that be? If we're seeking the will of God, that would be the image of Christ himself. Be transformed. And he tells us how to start this. What is the starting point of our transformation? The renewing of what? How many of you remember what was read here before just a few seconds ago? 
the renewing of the mind. You see, they say, they say those are the most 18, those are the most important 18 inches of your life. It's from here to here. From your head to your heart. Because as your mind goes, your heart will follow that direction. And if your, heart, if your mind is full of doubt, and if your f- mind is full of negativity, and if your mind is full of dirty thoughts, and if your mind is full of constant hate and bigotry, well, guess where your heart's going to be? If your heart, if your mind is full of rebellion against God, of not submitting to God, of saying, I love Jesus, but I'm going to do things my way, Guess what? That's how the heart's going to behave, the way the mind thinks. It starts up here. It starts in surrendering our mind to holy things. That's the part of being a a, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. It starts with the renewing of the mind. But how do we do that? How do we renew the mind? See, when we watch TV, it's not going to tell us how to renew my mind. When we watch a movie, it's not going to tell me how to renew my mind. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying that's wrong. But I'm saying that's not the place to search to renew your mind. That's more pattern again that's trying to change you. How do you renew your mind? Where is the source? Where is the materials we need to renew our minds? It's in God's revealed word, his scripture that he left for us to read. That's where we start. That's where we get the information. See, it's like, um, you know, you're standing there and there's something you want. And, and you're going, going through your mind. It's like, well, if you take it, no one's going to know. Just take it. But when you read the word of God and you get to the part where it says, you shall not steal. Now there's a different thing playing out there. You see that thing you want. You don't have the money to buy it. And instead of taking it, as you're ready to take it, that small, still voice says, remember, you shall not steal. I've renewed my mind. How? By filling it with God's word. Why do we see so many Christians in the church today that are living outside of God's will? It's because they are are biblically illiterate and they don't know what God requires of them. There's no other way of knowing what God's will for our lives is Outside of his scriptures. It's only in his scriptures that it's painted for us. Clearly for us to see. To understand. To then begin to renew that mindset. I can't make people love church. I can't make people love singing hymns or choruses to God. I can't make people devote themselves to reading scripture or praying to God. You see, the Holy Spirit brings that in, and then it's up to the individual. It's up to the person to let their mind be renewed and find new interest in spiritual things. If you don't have interest in spiritual things, there's nothing I could do up, up in here to make you more devoted to God. It has to come from your heart. You have to renew your mind down to the heart that you want more. That this isn't just boring, but this is enriching to you. That it's not just songs, but that those words speak to your heart. That it isn't just Pastor Joe screaming out a sermon, but it's the Word of God being uh, uh, translated through His Holy Spirit. I can't change that mindset in you unless you yourself have that heart attitude that this is important to me. You know, when I was a little kid, 
I'm going to be honest with you. I hated church. They forced you to sit down. They're saying a lot of stuff that I don't know, I'm not interested in. You know, I wanted to watch Batman. <laughs> and as I grew older, I stopped thinking like a child. And I began to think like a man. And it dawned on me that these things are good and that these things are pleasing. This is God's will for my life. And getting together with other saints becomes something good to do, something enjoyable. It's not going to a circus. It's enjoying and being enriched by God's presence with one another. Renewing of the mind, changing of the mind. So, so I, 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 I want to finish up here. We're getting really short on time. But um, I just want to finish up here with, with, with some, uh, um, some steps that we could take, right, uh, on, on, on following and knowing the will of, of God. Um, you know, we think that, that it's, you know, God's will and, and how do I know God's will? And, and yet, when we draw close to him, he draws close to us. We start getting a revelation of what God's will is. I mean, we got, we got people in the Bible that we could go to for that. We got Noah. Noah got a revelation of what God's will was going to be. Right? He went out, he bought himself an umbrella for him and his family. Right? We got Abraham. He knew what God's will was going to be. God revealed it to him. That through his seed, the Savior of the world was to come. We got... People like uh, 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 Gideon, who saw God's will revealed to him. Gideon, who thought he was a nobody, who thought he would never amount to anything, and learned that God uses the small things to confound the wise. That God uses the weak to beat the strong. God's will revealed. Um... Let's see if I can find it here. I don't want to misquote it. But how many of you have heard of Blackaby and some of his writings? Yeah, I'm not going to find it. now. I lost my spot here a long time ago. That's what happens when you're at lib, right? When you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, you lose your script. <laughs> I think that's a good thing, isn't it? Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to go over these really quick. So there are steps in discovering God's will for our lives. I'm going to go over these steps. And it's the first step is things, you're going to hear things that I mentioned already in my sermon, but be patient. First thing is this, talk regularly with God. He's calling now. Talk regularly with God, right? And what, what do we call that? Huh? Prayer, right? Talk regularly with God. Just like any other relationship. Relationships get stronger the more time you spend with the other person. And your relationship with God will get stronger the more time you spend talking to him. Talk to God. And then take time to listen. Because you might be surprised what you might hear from the Lord. Another thing is dive into the Bible and study the word of God. The Bible is like an, a, a map. And I know us men never want directions. But it's important when we're talking about this map. This is the map of life. When, when, when we follow our own map, what happens is we went up wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. But when we follow God's map. God has a way of getting us from point A to point B in knowing his will for our lives. So, so try to read a little bit of the Bible every day. Uh, it's not a heavy assignment. You know, I, I, every night I post the next uh, uh, chapter of reading the Bible in a year on my Facebook, on, on the church's Facebook page. And um, it's my way of, of saying, this is what I'm doing Join me in this. Participate in knowing God's will. 
in reading God's word. And if you don't understand it, then pray for understanding or seek someone who could explain it to you. Another thing is pay attention to the Holy Spirit. Pay attention to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes God guides us through that small, still voice. I mentioned that earlier. But when we follow God's direction, you know what we wind up with? Peace. When your life is full of turmoil and falling apart and the fringes are hanging out and you have no peace in your life, guess what? Maybe you're not following God's will for your life. And that'll bring depression. That'll bring suicidal thoughts. That'll bring uh, um, ideas that you don't want to be around others. We need to let the Holy Spirit fill us, guide us, and be sensitive to his voice. And the, the product of that is peace. How many of you want peace in your life? I don't see any hands. All right. Follow the Holy Spirit. Another one is this. Be open to change. Be open to change. You see, following God's will many times does not look like our will. Am I making myself clear? Sometimes we need to adjust our ideas to what God's idea is in life. Maybe we're, we're, we're looking for a new job. Well, why not ask for God's will? What are you going to lose? You might get a good job if you do that and not have to quit after a couple of weeks. How about marriage? Are you asking for God's will on who you will marry? I know today and date that may not seem important to some people, but for God, it's still important. And God will show you what his will for you is. One of the most destructive things I've seen in the church are people who are married with people who are not in the church. Because it brings turmoil in their lives. It brings turmoil in their household. And they want you to do one thing, but you want to do what God wants you to do. And so God's will and your spouse's will somehow clash. And there's never peace in the home when it comes to spiritual things. So seek God's will in that and be open to change. Maybe God wants you to change your plans and go in a different direction. And another one is this. Look for God's will in everyday life. In everyday life, look for God's will. You're standing in line a little too long. Instead of huffing and puffing beneath your teeth, ask God, who on this line, Lord, needs to get a good word of comfort today? Who needs to hear some kind word today? Who needs to hear that Jesus loves you? Whatever you're going through doesn't change God's love toward you. Every moment, seek those moments where God's will could be done in your life. The minute you wake up, what do you do? After you check your Facebook news, uh, news feed. What do we do? The first thing we wake up. Do we thank God for the day? Do we thank God for another breath of life? Do we ask God, God, let your will be done in my life today? God, uh, take me to where you want me to be. Help me to talk to whom you want me to talk about you, about good things, about positive things. How come it's so easy for us, and I'm talking about myself too, to stand there and start talking to somebody about negative things, but when it comes to talk about the positivity of God and his love and his righteousness and his salvation, we have a problem with that, don't we? 
All right. Another thing is, check the decisions you make with trusted friends and with mentors. Now, I don't want to sound chauvinistic, but it's important for men to have mentors. It's important for young women to have mentors in the church. It's the only way we learn. It's almost like an apprenticeship. A young mother could learn how to be a good mother by the older mothers in the church. The church needs to be the church. And when we're gathered in the church and there is a child roaming, it's up to the church to get up, get that child, take it to its mom and say, oh, isn't he a beautiful little child? Hold your child. We need to be the church. We need to watch out for one another. And we need to do it with love. And when we do it with love, you're never going to fail. We need mentors. We need people who we can look up to. We need people that we can walk up to. We need people that we could call on the phone. We need people that we could uh, sh- um, uh, sp- just, you know, give our ideas of what's going on and, and hear, get some feedback. Some biblical feedback from them and some help in guiding us through the different difficulties, the different paths in life. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm about finished here. (laughs) So this is where everybody goes. Remember this, that life is a journey. And in that journey, we take steps. And the worst part of a journey and taking steps is quitting halfway. Get back up. If you feel that that you've been doing your own thing, but you want to get back into following God's will, get back up. Dust yourself off and get back on the journey. Jesus is there with arms open wide. It's okay, you know, to, to, to just say, Lord, help me through this day. Help me one day at a time to walk through this. I made a mistake. I turn around, Lord. I want your will done in my life. We need to make an effort. I'm going to finish with 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God, right? This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. How awesome is that? You want your prayers to be heard. You want your life to be directed. You want to be able to stand there and have peace in your life. Then follow God's will for your life. Open the Bible and find out what God's will is for you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you today with an open heart with eagerness to understand your will for my life. You're the creator. You made all things. Your plan is perfect. Help me to trust in your wisdom and love. I seek to align my desires with yours. Lord, please guide me in every step. Open my eyes to see the path. The path that you have set before me. Help me to hear your voice clearly in the midst of a world that's constantly calling me to fit into its pattern. Help me to follow. Help me to be encouraged by the the simple fact that you care enough of me to let me know that you have a will for my life. Lord, even when the journey gets tough, help me through the power of your Holy Spirit to hear you and to not just be a hearer of your word, Lord, but to be a doer of your word. Help us, Lord, to adjust our lives and rearrange our will will, so that it would follow your will, your good perfect and pleasing will. 
I pray for all of this, Lord, in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song.